Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Everything is pretty much back to normal. There are some spots that are very obvious when you come into the park that we did have a wildfire. The Jewett Mine Reclamation Land is like a large contiguous island of native habitat. We're one of the few institutions that have ever bred them in captivity. Huh. They're a hard creature to keep alive because of their specialized diet and their light requirements. It's hard to see and know what's coming and know there's not much you can do to stop it. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. In April of 2011, a wildfire roared through Possum Kingdom State Park. It's heartbreaking to see what has happened to the park. I've worked here for 12 years and I've been coming here ever since I was a little boy. And uh, never seen it, of course, like this. Two years later, the park is on its way back. Everything is pretty much back to normal. There are some spots that are very obvious when you come into the park that we did have a wildfire. Mother Nature is responding well, but uh, it's just a matter of time. To help Mother Nature along, work crews from a nearby prison give the trails a bit of a makeover. They come out here a couple of times a week and, and they've been a really great help to us. They have really helped to facilitate a lot of our cleaning up and, and building some new trails. Once you get down off the hill, it seems like it hasn't been touched at all. No, you can uh, drop it down in front of that rock. The reason we like coming here is because most of the spots are secluded, it's just nice and green and lots of shady places to put your tent. <laughs> when it comes to the wildlife, the birds and the deer have returned. When you come into the park, you still see deer. As far as our counts go, they're almost exactly what they have been for the last five or six years. The wildlife and the park have remained resilient. For this park on the lake, that wildfire sure seems like a distant memory. We have a really great lake. It's a big lake that, that goes on forever. So, uh, you know, we're open, our boat ramps are open, and, and uh, the more the merrier. This is a coal mine. And this is a coal mine. A lot of people can't believe we go from this to this. I was raised in East Tennessee, and as a kid, I could look out my bedroom window and see where operators did strip mining on mountainsides. And my focus was to try to be part of a change. Located between Houston and Dallas, the 35,000-acre Jewett Mine helps fuel the Texas power grid. 
After the land is mined, native grasslands are restored. The Jewett Mine Reclamation Land is like a large contiguous island of native habitat. Well, the native grasses in this area are doing very well. The majority of the land that's mined, it's overgrazed, overutilized, not managed correctly. The result from reclamation typically yields a more producing landscape, better for wildlife, better for ranching. The mine is a pioneer in implementing more natural stream restoration. Traditional mine stream design would rely on straight linear channels with uh, concrete lined or reinforced structures. The Jewett Mine used a digital terrain model to develop a stream that's much more functional naturally. This is the beginning of a meandering stream. Engineers can design the, the stream of the creek before the dirt's ever moved, and that plan goes right on the dozer operator's machine so that they have knowledge of what dirt needs to be moved where. We tried to build a real stream channel that existed just like it did before. It has the bends and the riffles, the pools, trees. We plant native grasses. All this to try to leave this footprint really as if we were never here. And here is where the endangered interior leased tern lays its eggs. Once we've identified locations of these birds, we buffer these areas away from our operations. Grassland restoration benefits a variety of birds, including quail. Quail populations throughout Texas are on the decline. In this area, some people even believe them to be extinct. We're seeing quail utilize the reclamation land. My family's been here since the 1850s. I have a special interest in, in how we put this land back. On a personal level, we like to remind people that we live here, we breathe the air, we drink the water. We want to make this the best environment that we can. They're a symbol of the American West and a symbol of our independence and uniqueness. If you were picking a mascot for the state of Texas, you'd have to consider one small reptile with a legendary reputation. They are the state reptile of Texas. The Texas Horned Lizard. But you'd better hurry. While they're known by many names. The horned toads, horned frogs, but they're actually horned lizards. Horned lizard numbers are shrinking. This particular ant mound was just discovered this year, this spring. These folks aren't looking for ants as much as answers. If there's horned lizards in the area, this is the kind of place I would see them coming back to. In many yeah. places they once lived, horned lizards have vanished. It's just kind of sad to think that something that was at one time as common as the horned lizard in Texas is getting to a point where you just hardly see them, even when you look for them. As we go out and visit with ranchers, it's one of the first things they ask us, what's happened to the horned lizards? That question has biologists scrambling to study them in the places they're still doing well. Up in the southeast panhandle, Texas horned lizard uh, still very common in this part of the state. Chip Ruthven has been chasing horned lizards for many of his years in the field. We catch most of our horned lizards simply by driving down the roads and encountering them on the roads. You are not, oh, there he goes. While they're not normally hard to catch. Where did you go? They are well camouflaged. Oh, there he is. We have a mark recapture program. We'll uh, capture those animals temporarily, collect a variety of, of data off of them, weights, measurements. We'll take the clip, kind of clip it on the base of one horn, and then lift the lizard up. And there we got a weight of 25 grams. Capture the GPS coordinates of each lizard where we caught them. Uh, and then mark those individuals 116 millimeters total length. We've marked over a thousand here on this management area. For the lizards, marking means a rather severe pedicure. Clip off her two R toe. They get around pretty good without a toe or two. Clipping specific toe combinations identifies each lizard. 
And those lost toes serve another purpose. I will mail it off to TCU and they will do their genetic work on it. Texas Christian University is receiving horn-toed toes and other samples in the mail these days. I thought it would be a natural because it's TCU's mascot. The lizard lab work happens here, supervised by Dean Williams. Here's some more samples from Chip. Dean and his students are extracting DNA from cells to learn just how genetically unique horned lizard populations are around the state. What we have found so far is that they do seem to be highly genetically variable, at least in the matador. Populations that may have particularly low genetic variation that might indicate, okay, that population is experiencing problems right now. This genetic information will also be critical if horned lizards are ever to be restored to places where they have disappeared. Other research to prepare for that possibility is happening nearby at the Fort Worth Zoo. So how are the horned lizards doing? Doing very well on their diets? Good. Diane Barber and her staff are successfully keeping horned lizards at the zoo, and they're learning how to make more. We're one of the few institutions that have ever bred them in captivity. <laughs> Looks like she's not interested today. We'll have to try again tomorrow. They're a hard creature to keep alive because of their specialized diet and their light requirements. While captive breeding may help restore populations down the road, keeping horned lizards healthy in the wild still means having a better understanding of what they eat and where they live. And some of the places they live may surprise you. We have an isolated population of horned lizards on this coastal barrier island. One thing we're trying to do is to understand something about these populations that are still left, if there are certain reasons they've managed to hang on, and what that could tell us about conservation and maybe restoration of horned lizards. On the island, the crew hits the road, looking for lizards. And they have a large area to cover. It's a long, narrow strip of land that these horn lizards inhabit, almost 40 miles long. And we can check it when we get up there. Yeah. See if we've got any critters. So far today, we haven't caught anything. Traps have been set, but have nothing to offer. I got a grasshopper. <laughs> so the spotters scan the roadsides from shore to shore. I see one stop. And eventually, All right, let's go. they find a lizard. Beautiful. So it's 76.72. As in the panhandle. We're going to take the third toe. The lizard loses a digit. Put some neosporin on it. This time to analyze its diet. To get an isotopic reading from this guy. This DNA sample is somewhat less invasive. The swab. To our human mind, it's a little insulting. <laughs> but this lizard's big day is not over yet. So I'll put some super glue. We are going to powder tracker, so we are going to attach the fur patch. And what we do is we coat it with a fluorescent powder, release it, then in the evening we can go back and with a black light track the horn lizard and see specifically what grasses they're using, if they're using a path, if they're frequenting certain ant mounds as opposed to others. There you go. So it's really been a convenient, efficient way to gauge the habitat that they are using. Well, the fire ant, uh, pesticide use, those are probably compounding factors. Uh, the significant reason for the decline in the Texas horned lizard is uh, probably habitat loss. Not Mark, so he'll be a new one to collect some data off of. Studying horned lizards in their natural habitat may be the only way to keep them from fading into history. Toe clip code 2R7. Though there remain more questions than answers about the long-term health of horned lizards, it's clear they still have some friends. It appears that the toad is still alive. It's a horny toad. Yeah! Don't think there's anybody that doesn't like horned toad. Toad, it's a horny toad. It's kind of like the mascot of Texas. You don't have to get folks excited about horned lizards because they love them already. So they got an ugly face. He's a little horny toad. A little interest can go a long way towards saving a threatened species. I guess you could close them up and put them in the freezer. Yeah. 
That genetic study at TCU is funded by sales of horned lizard license plates. This is the second tiny one today. Volunteers collect valuable information around the state. They're adorable. Once you see your first horned lizard and you realize how imminent their demise could be, you can't help but try to get involved and try to do something. We've got 20% grasses. The study and preservation of native habitat continue. Bottom line is, is to determine practices to manage habitats for horned lizards. And what helps the horned lizard will almost certainly help other wildlife. There's a lot of other species too that maybe are not as popular or well known as horned lizards, but they face the same plight. What's going to benefit horned lizards is going to benefit most grassland species. Let him go on his merry way. Live long and prosper and raise lots of baby horny toes. First time I ever came down this creek, I was probably 11, 12 years old. This is Bubba Gray's. You know, my grandfather taught me how to deer and turkey hunt up in these woods. And this is his younger brother, Russell. We'd come down every summer and catch flathead catfish and some blue cats. This creek is a big part of their history. But soon this creek will be history. I just have a, a great connection to this creek, and it's just sad to see that destroyed. I think it's one of those things, unfortunately, people will appreciate it more once it's gone. Russell Graves has always lived in a small town. That's the only place he's ever wanted to live. This increased by eight inches from year one to year two. Are you with me? Growing up in a rural setting really influenced my choice of professions. You know, we've got the deer at the school land, so it just seemed like a natural to me to be a school teacher. Who, who wants these antlers to measure? I knew I could live in a small town and live in a rural area. One, two, three, four. Make sense? My name is Russell Graves, and for the past 16 years, I've been a teacher at Children's Independent School District in Children's, Texas. I'm also a professional photographer. Growing up in a rural atmosphere like I grew up in has had a huge effect in who I am, and it's definitely influenced my brand of photography. Everything I look at, I look at through the eyes of, a, of ultimately a country boy because that's what I am. In the early days when I'd send pictures off, I would get rejected so fast, the pictures would almost beat me back home. From there, just a lot of trial and error and just, you know, trying to work hard to get better and eventually things started working out pretty good for me. Early on, I, I was most comfortable with taking pictures of objects that couldn't talk back, you know, wildlife and cattle and, and landscapes and, and just really nature in general. As my career has evolved, I've gotten into taking pictures more of lifestyle shots, people in the outdoors, people hunting, people fishing. Russell now does commercial work for clients like Realtree and She Safari Clothing, and just recently, the Mud Brother. Yeah, I'm a stun hunter slash supermodel. Instead of hunting, we do stuff like this all the time. If it was left up to Russell, we'd never hunt. Yeah, Bubba's gonna be filming uh, with the video camera. I'm gonna be trying to shoot some steals of the birds. And then we're carrying all the gear to try to actually kill a turkey. Now Russell is combining video with his still images, partnering with his brother to produce a series of web-based videos they call and one of the things we've always tried to do is really try to mix a bunch of different mediums into one. Even though it sounds like a traditional hunting show, we really try to make it more about the story and about the personalities behind what we're doing 
instead of just going out and hunting. Yeah, you have to be quiet because we're trying to hunt for some deer. We really feel like we've excelled in that regard. The Graves brothers grew up near Bonham, Texas in rural Fannin County. Their home was always out in the country, so spending time in the woods just came naturally. Bubba still lives pretty close to where they grew up, and Russell makes regular trips back to visit family and traipse through the woods. Listen, just paddle me straight. Just keep me a good straight line down through here. I'm just going to film all around, okay? This float trip down Bodark Creek isn't just another paddle in the park. It's a trip to document the land and their memories. In a few years, Bodark Creek and much of the land that surrounds it will look a lot different. As Texas grows, so does the need for water. And as the need for water grows, cities are looking for that water wherever they can find it. To supply the future water needs of its customers, the North Texas Municipal Water District is building a $533 million water supply reservoir near Bonham. To do that, they'll be damming up Bodart Creek. That will in turn flood 16,000 acres of Fannin County land. A lot of people, they don't really know what's down these woods. You know, I've seen river otter, white-tailed deer, turkey. It's sad that we're going to lose this. This is a bodark tree. These roots are orange in color, and they've got this paper that hangs off of them. I, I don't know the botanical reason for that, but it's always been neat. Russell is capturing images for a documentary that he and Bubba are putting together about the creek and the woods and how their lives have been shaped by this land. This is a story about how a creek, muddy and I suppose insignificant to most, transforms. The transformation happens not only to the landscape, but to people as well. We came into this project trying not to be too political about it because of course, you know, we've got feelings about the uh, water issues that concern this part of Texas and the loss of hardwood bottomlands. But ultimately it became a personal project we thought about what this creek means to us and we thought about how we could preserve its legacy and what it means to us from a personal standpoint. See, so let me show you this. When I first came down here, all this was still woods and that's when I thought they were just thinning this. They got the idea for the documentary while they were shooting a Hunt Junkies episode. Just over that way, Russell. The woods where they had grown up, hunted and filmed many of their projects were being cut down before their eyes. For now though, the woods are dead. Sitting on what used to be 200 acres of old trees, I close my eyes and listen for the sounds of wild turkeys, crows, and owls. But now silence fills the gap. And this is just one of the dominoes that have fallen all along this Bodart Creek bottom. They've got a resource that's worth money and before their land's condemned and bought by the North Texas Municipal Water Authority, they're coming in and selling their timber, clear cutting all the trees, which is really changing the face of an ecosystem that's thousands and thousands of years old. In the late fall of 2009, Bubba and I launched one more time to float the final part of our canoe trip. Russell and Bubba Graves have spent most of their lives as part of this Texas landscape. For them, this film project is as much about the future as it is about their past. We've been coming down to this, this bottom land since we were little boys, and, and so much of our life has been spent down here. It's hard to see and know what's coming, and know there's not much you can do to stop it. Our project has never been an activist sort of film. The project is what it is, and the lake is what it is and there's not a whole lot that two people can do. But ultimately, if we can just share our love of this and let people understand how culturally, historically, and naturally important this bottomland is to this county and these type of bottomlands are to Texas, you know, maybe that'll change minds in the future.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.